Hi, I'm going to talk about AI applied to genomics. In our lab, we study genomics. We combine biology, computational biology, and clinical questions. And our overall goal is to reach better decisions next to the bedside. For that, we collect a lot of data. It could be DNA, it could be RNA, it could be clinical information. And we require a lot of computational power in order to process this data. We are basing our analysis on three revolutions. The first revolution occurred about 20 years ago when the first human DNA was read from beginning to end, three billion letters. Since then, in bioinformatics, we're trying to understand the various changes in the DNA that could lead to diseases. And in 2020, we also saw that we can now write the DNA or write the RNA. We are all living in pandemic times. We have seen that a point mutation in a very small virus could cause a devastating pandemic surrounding the entire world. We also saw that based on reading the DNA of the virus, understanding it in bio, using bioinformatics and writing a short sequence or DNA or RNA, injecting it to billions of shoulders around the world could also bring us out of this pandemic. Let's start from basics. A building is built out of blocks and our body is built out of cells. Many cells, billions of cells bound together forms tissues, they form many tissues, form organs, systems, and the entire body. Inside the cell, we have a nucleus. Now, if we increase our cell, and if we could open with tweezers, the nucleus inside every cell of our body, we'll take out a small string, the length of 1.8 meters. This is the DNA, the genomic information, the book of life, how to write or generate the entire body from beginning to end, exactly the same information in all our cells. All our cells have the same DNA, so I'm now scattering DNA around me, you are scattering DNA around you. All our cells have the same information inside. What happens in cancer? Accumulation of point muta mutations, changes in the DNA, could lead to renegade cells at a specific site, and then we have a tumor. Now, if these DNA sequences or cells accumulate additional mutations, these cells can also metastasize, move from one side of the body to another side of the body. If we will be clever enough or fast enough or good enough to identify these mutations very early in development of cancer, that would be a huge leap in our understanding of the disease and also very beneficial in stopping cancer. This is a microscopic slide of many cells stuck to each other. Now, if I ask you, can I, you identify by eye the malignant cells or possibly the pre-malignant cells, I assume most of you will not be able to do it. If you give it to a pathology, an experienced one, they will probably be able to identify them. And also there's many software now that could do this analysis as well. But I wanna tell you that even before you could see the changes in the cells, inside the cells, there are point mutations or changes in the DNA that would lead to cancer development. Here you can see a DNA sequence, which is represented by four letters, A, G, T, and C. This is the code of life. On the left-hand side, the cell doesn't have a mutation. On the right-hand side, you can see a few minute mutations. Now, if we could go inside all the cells of our body and read the entire DNA, we could probably identify that way point mutations that might lead to cancer. But specifically, we can't really do that. We can't enter, enter the cells and we can't read all the DNA. However, what we can do is we could look at floating DNA within our cells. So in our, in our cells around our blood, we have, cell, we have cell free DNA floating around. And luckily enough, the blood circulates in our entire body. Now, if we have a powerful enough machine that could take all these small pieces of DNA and read them and generate a lot of data from them and then use computational analysis to find these minute changes of DNA, maybe we will be able to identify cancer or other diseases ahead of time. And this is exactly what we do, but we rely on two technologies. One of them is the advance in computer power 
and storage. You can see here just one example, five megabytes on the left-hand side, uh, which, which amount to about uh, one ton in size. And on the right-hand side, you could see about 60 years later, one terabyte at the fingertips of a person. This is one technology we use, advancing computational power. Another one maybe you are less familiar with is our ability to read DNA. On the left-hand side, you can see the first automatic DNA sequencer from 1987, a Sanger sequencing. On the right-hand side, you could see what we use today, which is the second generation sequencing. Now, if we plot both of them, we use this for data and computation. If we plot both of them on the same graph, you can see Moore's law here, and you can see our ability to read DNA or cost per human DNA decreasing on an exponential graph. Using both these technologies, we can probably try to apply identifying diseases ahead of time. Using deep learning in medical applications is quite popular these days. However, it is mostly used for image analysis. You can see here, and I mentioned the pathology before, you can see the slides here at the top, and also for text mining or NLP. We used AI and deep learning for genomics, which is much less popular, and I'll show you our studies. So in our first research, we wanted to segregate four types of cancer. We used existing data published in 2007 by Fallon et al. They segregated four types of cancer based on their algorithms. And they showed that if they see accumulation of specific mutation, known mutations at sites on the DNA circulating in the blood of patients, they could segregate these samples into four types of cancers. Now we wanted to apply a different approach. We wanted to apply deep learning. So this study was carried out in the lab by Artyom Danilevsky, a PhD student. He applied the deep learning classifier and trained it before that using raw DNA sequencing. So the actual output from the second generation sequencing I showed you before. The area under the curve of the published paper was 0.93 we were able to achieve 0.97. Now, it's not only improvement of the algorithm, but we did notice a few features that really make it stand out. For example, we were able to base our segregation based on thousands of reads and not millions of reads, meaning we will use less materials and less reading materials in the future. And we were able to identify it based on raw sequencing data and not on specific known cancer mutations. So how does it work? We have the input, the model has the input. You can see the DNA reads here, sequences represented by four letters of patient one, patient two, and so on. We turn it into a binary code, zeros and ones, and we're loading large amounts of data, gigabytes to terabytes for the training, for the training set. We're looking at a very discrete set in the DNA, 80,000 nucleotides, which include 58 genes out of 20,000 genes in the human DNA. It's about five gigabytes of data per sample. And we have 200 samples of cancer. It's divided into two models. A decoder model uses dense layer to perform the classification. Unsupervised training is used to train the encoder separately. We know that we could use larger amounts to train this publicly available data, petabytes. However, we are extremely limited. If we use hundreds of gigabytes, it takes us days to train it. I'm not talking about terabytes, which will take us weeks, and we're not even thinking about training on petabytes, which will probably take us many months. And what was the outcome of our analysis? You can see here, this is the area under the curve. You can see our accuracy under the red arrow versus the published data under the black arrow. We were able to segregate four types of cancer based on profiling, raw sequencing data using a deep learning algorithm into four types of cancer based on a simple blood test. And you can see the separation here. The best separation is for colorectal cancer. And then we went and applied it to identifying colorectal cancer for other types of uh, uh, um, samples. And these are fecal samples, feces from colorectal cancer patients versus, uh, versus normal controls. So we did the metagenomics here. And again, this is published data. The area under the curve of these authors was 0.84. You can see their performance here, here of metagenomics together with FOBT. This is the standard for identifying a, a colorectal cancer. 
you can see we ran a deep learning classifier training on raw sequencing data coming out of the sequencing machine. Our area under the curve was 0.93. Performance was better. But again, this is not the only finding here. What we also noticed is that we are able to identify whether these sequencing come from the DNA of the bacteria or DNA of the host. So to summarize here, deep learning is a valid technique for genomic DNA identification. Deep learning can be used for hidden information in raw sequencing data, and we want to understand the results, why and how. A computational summary is more data for training will improve our results. Computational power is needed more than our few GPOs, and op optimizing hyperparameters requires multiple runs. And this is us together with Professor Guy Lahat in the operation room collecting additional samples. So taking the data for perform generating information, knowledge, and clinic takes time. We really want to move from sick care to healthcare, identifying ahead of time. Another study on the, in the lab runs on non-invasive prenatal testing. This is what is done today. A blood sample is taken from a pregnant woman and analysis is performed to identify whether there are specific changes in chromosomal levels. But looking at chromosomes is like looking at planet Earth from, from outside and trying to identify whether there is additional continent. What we wanna do is enter a continent, a city, a street, a house, and identify point mutations in this DNA. And this is exactly our approach. Just to show you the complexity of our analysis, let's compare our genomic analysis versus image analysis. There are tensor, granularity, and instances, cases, and complexities. Image data size is much smaller than our data size, in terms of granularity, DNA is not continuous. Every pixel, every mutation, every change is relevant and kernel sizes are small. And instances, we limit ourselves to specific sites on the DNA. We look at only about 3 million sites. In fact, we could look at 3 billion nucleotides or site, but we are extremely limited. We know our analysis is biased. We do not have the power of Google uh, models or algorithms or GPUs, and we always have to fit the resources to what we do. When we look at applying AI to genomics, we feel like we're trying to drink from a fire hydrant, massive amount of information with limited ability to grasp them, grasp them all. This is the algorithm we ran. We trained our samples. There are different features that separate the embryonic DNA from the mother's DNA. For example, fragment size, you can see here, in red are the fragment sizes of the embryonic DNA and the mother DNA. There are many other features as well. We used our algorithms and you can see the results here. We were able to have, have the errors based on deep learning algorithms and we're using them further on in order to understand how we can apply this to sequence the entire embryonic DNA from beginning to end based on circulating DNA in the mother's blood and this blood test can be taken at a very early stage in the first trimester at week 10. So summarizing here, the biomedical summary is very similar to the previous summary. Deep learning is a valid technique for genomic DNA analysis. Deep learning can use information hidden, hidden in raw sequencing data, and we want to understand the results, why and how. More data for training will improve our results. More computational power, we are always limited. We are always biased because we have to fit our analysis to our research and optimizing hyperparameters requires multiple runs. This is the wonderful team performing the experiments in the lab. Top left-hand side, Artyom did the cancer study. Bottom right-hand side, Tom, together with Yonatan, performed the NIPT, the pregnant women data analysis. When applying AI to genomics, we believe that we are on the right track. There's a lot of work to be carried out. And the bottom line is that we want to reach better decisions next to the bedsides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noam. Uh, it was very interesting. And uh, we'll look now for questions from the audience. Um, so, um, there is a question about what computing power are you using? I think you you answered it, but you can comment on this. So we, we use a, a few GPUs, which is uh, extremely limited, uh, limiting our, our ability. 
And there's also a limitation because our data is very large and we have to load our data. We need a lot of RAM to load our data onto the GPUs. And this is a, a bottleneck as well in our analysis. If we could get access to a, a huge computational analysis, we are sure that we will be able to increase or increase our performance and get better results out of it. Okay. Um, another question is uh, how were you able to find the features using neural net where explainability is an issue? Uh oh, in terms of sizes. So we actually uh, think about the biology. We couldn't find it from uh, our deep learning analysis. What we do is we know the biology of it. So we know that fragment sizes are different. So we know we can weight them differently. Other features we know that we could use, for example, are locations. So embryonic DNA might come from different sites on the DNA versus the mother's DNA. We also know there's a difference in GC content. So we don't necessarily receive this from our algorithm. We come with a prior knowledge to the analysis and we can weigh it differently within the computational pipeline. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, why do you need to read the entire DNA, not just the locations with the specific known mutations? So it's correct that we could focus sometimes on uh, known mutations. However, we like approaching these projects unbiased. So when we looked at the cancer DNA, what the uh, uh, Fallon paper did is they looked at known mutations and they segregated the cancer based on known mutations. We approached it with a more naive question. Can we separate the samples just by teaching our, our algorithm what cancer looks like and what, or presenting to our algorithm what cancer looks like what wild type looks like, and eventually it worked better. Meaning there are hidden information, there are hidden mutations there, and if we take this naive approach, maybe our separations would be better. Then we go into the DNA and we look at it and we try to understand what are the segregating mutations based on. So this will also allow us to find new genes, additional genes to help us segregate between the different types of uh, samples. Okay, and um, a last question is, um, what is the next technology that would lead to the DNA uh, sequencing revolution? Okay, so I showed the graph that uh, there's a reducing cost in uh, DNA sequencing. Obviously, we're not stopping here. So there are many companies uh, working on uh, reducing the cost, increasing the high throughput. And uh, we believe that in one or two years, the cost would be one-tenth of what we, we pay now and the capacity and the ability to read would uh, increase by 10 times. So it's, a, it's an increasing world where we could read more and more information. And the bottleneck eventually is computational, much more than our ability to read DNA. So there's a lot of work on this field.